Well, good morning. Welcome to Citadel Square. We hope you're having a great morning that you're gathered together to sing and celebrate and worship and remember who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Uh, so as we come together uh, to, to worship today, I want to read from John chapter 14. Uh, it's an amazing passage where Jesus gathers together his disciples as he looks to, as he heads towards the cross, the crucifixion, uh, and and he, he prepares them for what's about to happen. Uh, so you can read through chapter 14, 15, and 16 and see what Jesus says there. There's so much great teaching and encouragement uh, for us uh, especially as we think about what Jesus has accomplished for us. But I want to read specifically, uh, starting in verse 27. It says this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am a going away, and I will come to you. If you have loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the father for the God father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. So Jesus says, there's a peace that I'm giving to you uh, that, that will allow you to walk through the troubled times that are ahead. Uh, you will be tempted uh, to lose heart. You will be tempted to be afraid, but remember when it happens, what I've said that you can trust me. And it's an amazing thing to realize that when Jesus returns, when he's resurrected from the dead after the crucifixion, the first thing he says to his disciples is, peace be with you. Uh, so I don't know about you, uh, but often I'm, I'm tempted to lose heart, to be troubled, to not live uh, with confidence in who God is and what he's done for me in Jesus, especially uh, when we're in troubled times. Uh, so I want to encourage you today that these truths are here for you, that Jesus said that, that the Holy Spirit would bring to mind these truths so that you'd remember what he said. So that's true for us today, that we can remember what he said for us, uh, that we go to the scriptures and we say, who is he uh, and where is my confidence? And it's in him. And so let's pray as we worship that he would be honored, that our hope and our trust would be fully in him, that we'd look to what he has done for us at the cross and that our hearts would have peace. Would you pray with me? And Jesus, we love you. We worship you. We thank you. Uh, be with us as we gather in our homes, with friends, with family, as we come to worship you today. Would you remind us by the work of your Holy Spirit what you've said? Uh, would you lead us to respond with glad and joyful hearts in the midst of troubling times uh, with peace that you can provide? Lead us as we sing, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. Good morning, Citadel Square. Pastor Steve here. Hey, before we get going into our next section in the book of Galatians, I want to give you a quick announcement. We continue to watch the COVID numbers in the city of Charleston, looking forward eagerly to the day when we get to regather in our space. But uh, until that point, we're going to put another event on the calendar. We're going to gather together again outside at our location here at 328 Meeting Street next week. So be on the lookout for an email from us that will give you some details. Uh, bring a mask, bring a lawn chair. You'll be able to sit in the shade and we'll get the chance to connect and see each other, albeit from a distance. But uh, pray you'll be encouraged by that time next Sunday evening. All right. Well, let's get going here with what we're dealing with in the book of Galatians. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to look really at the last section of Paul's theological argument before he gets into the practical nature of how this church ought to live in the truth that they've received. So, Paul, as he's built his case, we saw last week, we really ended with Paul the apostle, and we looked at his heart, and we saw two things, that tenacity for the truth and that passion for people that really characterized the gospel minister. And you saw Paul just open his heart to these people. He talked about his fear of working in vain. He talked about being perplexed and being in the anguish of childbirth again. So Paul was really emotionally vulnerable and emotionally raw. Well, He's done this through the course of his argument. He's talked about theology. He's led you through an Old Testament Bible study. He's shown you his heart. Well, Paul's going to come at this issue one more time. Uh, and what Paul is going to do is he's going to tell a story. Now, you can think of stories throughout the scriptures that really serve to draw us into what's happening. You can think about uh, maybe one of the common ones that really came to mind was Nathan confronting David after his sin with Bathsheba. Nathan tells this incredibly picturesque story that draws David in and brings him to the point of repentance. Jesus did this as he spoke with the Pharisees. The Pharisees would perceive that Jesus tells parables against them. 
Jesus tells stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son that really draw the reader into what's going on. Well, what Paul is going to do here today is draw these Galatian believers into a story, and it's in the life of Abraham. Now, we've spent time looking at the life of Abraham before, but Paul is going to draw out these two ways of relating to Abraham in the lives of both Hagar and Sarah. So we're going to talk about that as we get going all the way through it, but let me begin with a bit of an illustration. Uh, Suzanne and I, we have six kids, and parenting for us oftentimes puts us in the seat of having to be kind of a mom or dad detective. Let me tell you what I mean. Uh, you as a parent will encounter these scenarios between your children where you have to piece together evidence from different people with different stories about a different event who all contribute to the outcome. And as a parent, you will ask a variety of questions. You will ask what happened? Who said what? How did this happen? How did they say it? But I think if there's one question, and I think this is a question that for me I ask and I get into conversation with my kids when I'm trying to diagnose and discover what has been going on that led us to this place. Eventually, sooner or later, as a parent, you will ask this question. Why did you do that? And frankly, I don't know why you ask that question as a parent. I don't know why I ask that question as a parent because every single time I ask that question, why did you do that? I don't get the answer that I want. I don't know what I think, what, uh, what answer I think I should get. I probably presume that I should get something like this, that, oh, Father, uh, my heart is sinful and I am an idolatrous individual. And I have put my hope and trust in the wrong things, and I have tried to achieve my own ends according to my own strength. And it had caused great disaster in my life. And oh, if you would forgive me and show me grace, I would be able to find redemption at your hand. And that's never the answer that I get. I get, typically, and you as a parent, you probably know the answer that you get. You get this answer. I don't know. And that highlights something very, very important because it highlights something about our children and frankly, something about ourselves is that we get ourselves into situations where we don't know why we're acting the way we are. We discover something about ourselves and Paul discovers something here about the Galatians that is fundamentally inconsistent that reveals that there's an expectation. And you have this and I have this because we all encounter situations in life where we discover ourselves to be inconsistent with the truth we say we believe. Well, that's exactly where the Galatians are. And Paul is about to paint a picture and draw them into this story to demonstrate the way that they ought to live. So let's pray. Let's jump in and see what Paul has to say to us here. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that gives light to our eyes to interpret, to understand, and to see what you are saying to us. I pray that for these few minutes as we look into this story that Paul shares with us, that we might gain a greater understanding, greater joy, greater freedom in our spiritual lives than perhaps we've had before. May we repent of the ways in which we try to work our spiritual lives according to the things that we can do and we contribute. And may we find great hope, joy, and freedom in what Jesus has done for us. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, so let's take a look here. Galatians 4, starting in verse 21. And now Paul is going to engage the Galatians here with this question. This is really the key question that Paul is going to answer with Galatians 5.1. And in between, you're going to have Paul paint this picture and demonstrate this uh, his theological points by appealing to the stories that happen in, in the book of Genesis. So watch what Paul says here. Galatians 4 verse 21, tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Now, uh, this idea of inconsistency is really demonstrated by uh, this question that Paul asks. Paul recognizes that the Galatian church is facing a temptation. They have received the message of faith in Jesus Christ. It has caused great joy in their life and in their heart, but now they are facing these false teachers who are tempting them to rely on 
the law, tempting them to depend not on what Jesus has done, but on how they can perform. So what Paul is asking when he begins is he's asking, how are you and how am I going to uh, respond when we are revealed to living uh, contrary to the truth that we say we believe? Hasn't that been Paul's point all the way through? That he has consistently counseled them to return to faith and trust in what God has done through Jesus. So he's asking them this question. You who desire to be under the law, that is, live your life and rely on law for your relationship with God, do you not listen to the law? Now, when Paul uses that term law, he's going to point all the way back to Genesis. So he's probably talking about the Genesis through Deuteronomy portion of your Bible. And that's where he's going to build his case. But it's important the way Paul does this by what he asks. See what he says? Do you not listen to the law? See, what Paul is facing in the temptations with the false teachers and the Galatian church, he's facing an interpretation issue in the way that they see the scriptures. The false teachers would enter into the church and claim that to be a true child of Abraham, you've got to get circumcised like Abraham. To be a true child of promise, you've got to follow the Old Testament rules, regulations, systems, structures, ceremonies, all of those things. Remember what Paul said last week? You observe days and seasons and years. I'm afraid I have labored over you in vain. We began with Peter's problem, distance between ethnic Jews and Gentiles. Now we have celebrations, and when you get into five and six, you're going to see people who are tempted to get circumcised. Paul continues to ask, do you not understand what the law says? Which makes you and I ask a very important question. How do we understand the law? Paul is going to say it is written two times in this passage, and then he's going to quote the scriptures in Isaiah. So what Paul is going to do to answer this desire to live life under the law is, again, use a biblical illustration and to draw the hearts and minds of the Galatian believers back to a proper understanding of the truth that is revealed in the scriptures. That's key. That's what you need when you face spiritual temptations to lean on your flesh. That's what I need when I face those temptations to lean on my flesh and not on the grace of God and Jesus Christ. So let's watch how Paul is going to build this uh, illustration for us. Take a look at verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. Now, Paul is going back to Genesis 16 to 21, and he's going to wrap all of those chapters together in this illustration. And he begins talking about the two sons that come from Abraham. Abraham has two sons, one from a free woman, Sarah, one from a slave woman, Hagar. Okay, The two sons, Ishmael from Hagar, Isaac from Sarah. You with me? That's where we are thus far. Two sons, two wives, both from uh, Abraham. Take a look at verse 23. But the son of the slave woman was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born according, born or through the promise. You understand that? You've probably seen that before if you've read the book of Genesis. Uh, Paul is coming back to Genesis chapter 16. Genesis chapter 16 is right after, in my Bible, Genesis chapter 15. And we've seen Genesis 15 before where God uh, declared Abraham righteous because Abraham trusted and had faith in God's word. It said that Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. Well, you move through Genesis 15 and God gives Abraham a promise where God gives him a covenant and he passes between the pieces and Abraham is asleep and God says, I will be faithful to my word. Well, Genesis 16 opens and it's been 10 years since Abraham has experienced that moment with God. And Sarah comes to Abraham and suggests something that is very, very common in their culture in the day. They have a slave named Hagar. She's of childbearing age. Sarah is not. Sarah says, let's not wait on the promise of God. Why don't you go into Hagar and we can have a child that way. That's got to be how God's going to fulfill his promise. Abraham listens. She gets pregnant and they have Ishmael. Well, now you move forward in the story and we know that God, that, uh, God also is faithful to his promise in the person of Sarah and gives them Isaac. So you've got two ways in which these two sons came about. One is according to the flesh, what Abraham could do. The other is according to the promise, which is what God could do. Okay, So you're watching the contrast that you've got 
uh, Paul laying out before us. Isaac, Ishmael, slave woman, free woman, child of the flesh, child of the promise. You with me? Okay, so let's keep moving. Take a look there at verse 24. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. Now, what Paul is going to do is take the truths that he's laid out in the narrative of the life of Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac, and begin to draw theological points from these two truths. Look at what he says in verse 24. Now, this may be interpreted allegorically. Now, Paul is going to do something here that really uh, you can't do and I can't do uh, because Paul's an apostle and Paul gets the right to be able to write scripture and see the risen Jesus. So what Paul does is interpret this in such a way where he's going to reveal some truths uh, that are principles that will be applied in the life of the Galatians. It's essentially an analogy. Uh, Paul's not giving you a fable like the tortoise and the hare, but he's going to draw some conclusions from the stories of Abraham, Isaac, I'm sorry, Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar. All right, this would be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. Now that's important as you begin. So we have a free woman, a slave woman, and we've got two covenants now uh, that are resulting in two kinds of sons. There are two covenants, he says in 24. One is from Mount Sinai bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. So when I look at this analogy that, that Paul is drawing, he's looking at Hagar as a slave, and he's equating her with the covenant that was given on Mount Sinai. Now, what happened on Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is the mountain that the nation of Israel came to, that Moses led them to after their redemption from slavery out of Egypt, where God gave the law, okay? So you've got a slave woman and you've got the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Watch how Paul's making this analogy. Look at verse 25. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children. Okay. So now Paul's moved his analogy. He said, you've got Hagar, Mount Sinai, Jerusalem. The result Slavery for Hagar, slavery at Sinai, slavery in Jerusalem. How does Paul make that point? Well, Paul has been building this slavery terminology for two chapters. So as he does this, what he's saying is, is labeling and identifying two very important places for the Jews. The first is Mount Sinai. They would look back to Mount Sinai as the place where God began now to covenant in relationship with his people. And that would be the geographical place. That's the giving of the law. That's the Mosaic covenant. And then you move to Jerusalem, another very important place for the Jews. That's the place where they would have the sacrifices, the ceremonies, the feasts, the celebrations. People would come up with their animals to partake in the rituals of Jewish religious life. So these are two key places. But Paul, as he closes this illustration and this analogy, says that they are in slavery with her children. That would be stunning to a Jew for Paul to equate Mount Sinai and the city of Jerusalem as being in spiritual slavery like Hagar, because the Jews would not trace their lineage from Hagar. They would trace their lineage from Sarah. They believe we're ethnic descendants of Sarah, not ethnic descendants of Hagar. Who were the ethnic descendants of Hagar? The Ishmaelites. Who were the descendants of Sarah? Isaac, the 12 tribes, Jacob, Judah, all the way down in the people of Israel. So for Paul to make this illustration is stunning at this point. To call out Mount Sinai and the current city Jerusalem as being not free, but enslaved. Now watch how Paul turns the metaphor. Look at verse 26. But the Jerusalem above is free and she is our mother. What is, what is Paul doing here? Paul is now contrasting Mount Sinai and present Jerusalem as being enslaved. Slavery, current Jerusalem, Mount Sinai. Now he's, doing, now he's moving the illustration, the analogy, to the spiritual realm where he says that the Jerusalem above is free. Hebrews says that we have come um, to the church of the firstborn enrolled in heaven. Um, 
what Paul is doing here is rooting his spiritual identity, not in his Jewishness, not in his ethnicity, not even in his spiritual performance. And we've seen how Paul has abandoned all that earlier in the book of Galatians. What Paul is doing is rooting his spirituality, rooting his true citizenship in heaven, like he says in Philippians chapter 3. And he's looking above. He's looking to the spiritual nature of who he is in Christ. He says the Jerusalem above is free. We're not enslaved like all of those uh, who are in, in current modern day Jerusalem. We are from the Jerusalem above. She is our mother. Now, watch what Paul does here. Because as Paul begins to root his spiritual heritage, his spiritual life above, he begins to distance himself from the earthly Jerusalem. Now, what Paul is going to do here is now move again to another scriptural example. And I'll tie these two together for you because this is a really tricky part of the book of Galatians. Take a look at verse 27. For it is written... Now, if you've got a Bible with cross-references, you would see that Paul is quoting something from Isaiah chapter 54. Now, I'll talk about that in a minute, but Isaiah 54 begins with the word sing. And it's a similar word here that Paul uses. He says rejoice, uh, call to mind the truth of what God is doing, and rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Now, why would Paul put that here in Galatians? Because Paul is now equating, O barren one who does not bear, all the way back with the beginning of the Jewish nation. And he's looking back to the child of promise. And who was the barren one? It's Sarah. So he's, he's, in a sense, he's taking this truth from Isaiah and applying it now to this, this uh, analogy that he's showing you. Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now, why does Paul quote this here? Let me tell you what's happening in Isaiah. In Isaiah, the people of Israel are out of their land. They're in bondage again. They're experiencing the consequences of their sinfulness and breaking of the covenant relationship with God. And they've been exiled. They're out of the land. They're in Babylon. They've lost their national identity. They've lost their worship and spiritual identity as the people of God, characterized by worshiping uh, at, the, at the tabernacle and, and the tent and all, and the, I'm sorry, the temple and all of those things. They've lost all that. They're in bondage and they're depressed and they're discouraged. And Isaiah is writing and telling these people who have nationally lost their hope to rejoice. Now, why? Why is Isaiah writing that? Now, if you've got a Bible, you know that uh, Isaiah 54 follows a very, very important chapter in the book of Isaiah. It follows Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 is the story of God's suffering servant, the one who will now take the sins of the nation upon his back and uh, experience the wrath of God for sin and suffer on behalf of his people to bring them back. So what is Isaiah doing? Isaiah is saying, rejoice, national Israel, because God will be faithful to his promise. It may look like you're out of the land. God's not doing anything. You've got no ability to bring about the promises of God. But sing and rejoice because God is faithful. Now, are you watching the point that Paul is pulling together here? He's got the story of Abraham and Sarah, where Abraham and Sarah looked at their life, looked at the barrenness of their womb, looked at their complete inability to bring about the promises of God and decided to do it in their own strength. In Isaiah, he's looking at the nation and he's telling the nation, sing and have hope and rejoice because God can, is the one who can bring you back to your land. Have faith and hope and trust, not in your ability, but in God's ability to be faithful to his word and to his people. So you're watching the themes happen here? Now, why is this important for Paul? Why does this apply to this primarily Gentile church? Watch Paul now apply this analogy that he's been drawing in verse 28. Now you brothers, what Paul is doing now is taking the truth of this patriarch story of Abraham 
and Sarah and Hagar and the truth of the nation of Israel nationally in Isaiah chapter 54. And now he's going to apply it to these Gentile believers. How is Paul going to move from the story of the Jewish heritage and Abraham and even in the exile to apply it to a Gentile church? How is he going to do that? Look at what he says. Now you brothers like Isaac are children of promise. That is a theological bombshell because the false teachers are, are trying to get the Gentile Christians to become like the Jews ethnically. And the only way they're going to do it is to be circumcised like the Jews, observe the law like the Jews, observe the ceremonies like the Jews, observe the dietary codes like the Jews. That's the only way that the false teachers see to make a Gentile like a Jew. It's to make them a proselyte, to make them act altogether like Jews. And what Paul does here is connect the Gentiles to Abraham, not according to the flesh, but through the spiritual lineage of Isaac. How does he do that? He does it because he says that the Gentiles are children of promise. Before, Jerusalem above is our mother. Here, we are children of promise, just like Isaac is. What does that mean for you and me? Listen, every Christian knows at the center of who they are, that they are a Christian, not because of something that they have done. They are a Christian. Now, they may have had a Christian upbringing. They have been taught the scriptures from a young age. They uh, may have had uh, Christian parents. They may have been in church for a long time. But a Christian knows that he or she is a believer and a Christian and right with God because of God's faithfulness to his promise in Jesus Christ. We don't look to our obedience. We don't look to our traditions. We don't look to our self-discipline. We don't look to our relative earnestness about our spiritual life at any, any point in our life. We look primarily to the fact that God has been faithful to his word in sending Jesus Christ to be the one who bore the wrath of God for our sins. That's how we become Isaac. How did Abraham and Sarah get Isaac? They put their faith in their trust, not in their ability, not in their strength, not in anything that they could do, but in God alone. And God was faithful to his promise. Now, is that ever a problem in a church? Well, Steve, what do you mean? Read verse 29. Look at what happens. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, so also it is now. Now, Paul's looking back to Genesis 21. In Genesis 21, when Isaac is born, it says that Ishmael mocked him. He showed contempt for Isaac because there are two ways of relating to God that is illustrated by Sarah and Hagar by Abraham and Hagar and Abraham and Sarah. There's one way of relating to God where we depend on our own flesh in what we can accomplish in our own timing, our own strength, and in our own ability. There's that way of relating to God. And Paul's been proving this point over and over that that leaves us enslaved. And there's another way that we relate to God, where we come to God empty of our own righteousness, our own ability, our own self-confidence, and we throw ourselves on the character of God and him being faithful to his promise and uh, that God would send and accomplish what we could never accomplish. Those are the only two ways to relate to God. If you trace this theme out through your Old Testament, you know what you get. You get a Cain versus Abel. You get a Ishmael and Isaac. You get a Jacob and an Esau. And on both situations, you have individuals that are characterized by life according to the flesh or life by faith. It's consistent through the Old Testament. You have this theme back and forth. And Paul says, Galatians, you have that problem now because you have people in your church who think that walking with God is dependent on what they can do and how they can perform and how hard they work and what ceremonies they keep and rituals they abide by and what traditions they have. And then, Galatian church, you have people who are walking with God by faith and God's promise and God's faithfulness to them in Jesus Christ. Those are the only two ways. Now, watch Paul quote the Bible one more time, and it's a really amusing way that he does it. Look at verse 30. But what does the scripture say? How am I going to handle 
in the church these two fundamentally opposed ways of relating to God. What do you think? What do you think Paul's going to say to do with these false teachers who are in the midst of the Galatian church? Look at what he quotes. Verse 30, what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Now, Sarah's not preaching the gospel in that quote. What Sarah's doing is being jealous and protective of her own son and vindictive against the son of Hagar. But Paul takes that to apply it to the Galatian church and tell them to get rid of the false teachers. Cast them out. And you see the phrase he uses again? The, the son of the slave woman shall not inherit. That's what Paul's already shared in Galatians chapter 3. He's talked about the inheritance that we receive by faith in what Jesus has done for us. And he says, cast out anybody and any teaching that would go contrary to the gospel that I've already preached. Remember what Paul said in Galatians 1? If someone preaches the gospel contrary to the one that I have preached to you, let them be accursed. Here, Paul says, kick them out of the church. This is essential for pure gospel preaching, pure gospel doctrine to be the center of what we believe as a church. We fundamentally believe that it is by grace, through faith, that every man, woman, and child is saved in what Jesus has done for them. They don't bring any obedience. They don't bring any tradition. They don't bring any dependence on themselves. They run from all that. They cast that out and they throw themselves upon the faithfulness of God to his promise. So watch Paul wrap it up. Look at verse 31. Brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Now this is important. He just said that Gentiles are sons or children of the free woman. How? Gentiles receive the lineage from Abraham by having the faith of Abraham, by putting faith in the trust, uh, faith and trust in what God will do to bring about his promise. Ultimately, Paul says, you now have the fulfillment of God's promise in Jesus Christ, and you now are a descendant of Abraham because you have come to God by faith in what God has done to send the true child of promise. So, have you watched these, these contrasts that Paul has built for us? Paul has built a free woman and a slave woman, a Jerusalem above, a Jerusalem below. He said inheritance and no inheritance. He said life according to the covenant um, of flesh and life according to the covenant of promise. And he's built all that and wrapped all that up. He's removed the ethnic distinctions that the false teachers are trying to put in place. And he says, Galatians, Gentiles, you are children of promise because God has been faithful to his word. So what's Paul's application here? The application of this whole story is Galatians 5.1. This verse serves as a fulcrum to lead you into the practical portion of the book and to look back at Paul's entire argument in Galatians 3 and 4. Look at what Paul says. For freedom, Christ has set us free. The true child of the promise has come. In him I have hope, in him I have redemption, in him I have right standing, in him I have a citizenship that is in heaven, and he has set me free. Now, in context, what does it mean to be set free? Paul's going to apply that later, but in context, to be set free is to be set free from all of the rules and expectations and laws that are inherent to the Mosaic Covenant. That era is over. We now relate to God on the basis of Jesus' perfect life, death, burial, resurrection, and welcome into the church of the firstborn, like Hebrews says. What a great picture. Paul says, Christ has set you free. He set you free for freedom's sake. You don't have to go back. Watch what he says to go on. And this really, these two words that he says next, these next two words are the answer to 421. We began in 421 with tell me you who desire to live under the law. What does the scripture say? And by the end in Galatians 5.1, Paul has moved to interpret the entire Old Testament in light of Jesus Christ. Did you see that? This is why understanding Jesus Christ in the context of the scriptures is so important because the false teachers are using your entire Old Testament to keep people in bondage. 
That is so essential for the proper interpretation of the scriptures. Because Paul says there's a new interpretive era that has dawned in the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he says, stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back. Don't go back to these old rules and regulations. Don't be deceived by these false teachers. Christ did not come and live and die for you to go back into this way of thinking, back into this slavery mindset to where you are bound according to all the things that you think you ought to do for God and never live up to. Listen, this is why, let me apply this. These, this church is having to cling to gospel doctrine. They're having to stand firm. They're not being told to do something. They're being told to hold to something to make sure that their church isn't deceived and dragged away into all sorts of other things that compete with the by grace through faith message in Jesus Christ. This is why for us, when we are a people of the word of God, this becomes an incredibly dangerous way for you to approach your Bible. What, Steve, what do you mean? Listen, why would we read the Bible if not through a Christ-centered lens? Because this shows, this text shows that you can read the Bible and still be enslaved in your relationship with God. Because when you read the Bible and you encounter the truth of God's word and the character of God and the holiness of God, you and I know that we come to points where we get exposed and the thing that is underneath this desire that began in Galatians 4.21 is this reality of when our lives don't match. That's why we began with this illustration with my kids that was hilarious. We now look at our lives in light of the truth of God and recognize that we are now inconsistent. We don't know why we don't act according to the things that we believe. We don't know why we don't obey the things we know we ought to obey. We are fundamentally inconsistent people. And the temptation for you and for me is when we're faced with that inconsistency. Because listen, when you read the scriptures, you will discover that you are an inconsistent individual. You are not consistent as Jesus Christ. And now when you find that in your heart and it gets shown to you as you read the Bible and you go, boy, I am not like that. Uh, I do not believe that. I don't follow and live my life as if that is true. You are facing the same temptation that the Galatians are. The Galatians are sinners. They knew they were sinners. Paul preached the gospel to reveal that they were sinners. The Galatians are facing maintenance of their relationship with God by adhering to these extra rules and regulations. And you face that temptation. And I face that temptation because when I am revealed uh, as being inconsistent, don't you feel that temptation? Don't you recognize the desire in your heart to go, boy, I'm going to do better. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to have some New Year's resolutions to get my life in order. I'm going to start waking up early. I'm going to start doing the things that I haven't done before and I haven't uh, done recently, but I'm definitely going to do this time. And you begin to make lists and you recognize that any time that you start to do that in your Christian life, you are now operating according to the flesh. When you face that temptation though, and you are a child of promise, your inconsistencies get revealed and you now get drawn like a moth to a flame to the consistency of Jesus Christ, to his faithfulness on your behalf, to clinging to the truth of God's goodness and his character of sending Christ, the consistent one who has died on the cross for our sins. And I now run and am dependent not on my own performance, but on Christ's performance, not on my own obedience, but his perfect obedient life. So what do we do with our inconsistencies when they're revealed? We don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. We don't walk again back into solutions and disciplines and practices and traditions and things we've always done and try harder isms. We don't do that. Another thing that happens when we read the scriptures is that we get exposed to our, not just our inconsistencies, but eventually, sooner or later, you will get exposed in your spiritual life to your inability. You will recognize that if not for the grace of God, I have no ability to bring about God's promise and faithfulness in my life. I am totally dependent on God's grace toward me. That's the picture we have in this story of Abraham and Sarah. 
That's what Paul is trying to get the Galatians to lay hold of and to believe in, to recognize that not only are you inconsistent, you are unable. There is nothing good in you, Paul talks about in Romans. Paul says you can't re- achieve right relationship with God on your own. Rather, you are enslaved. Not only that, it's as possible as Sarah bringing forth a child on her own. But when we come to the scriptures and we begin to read the scriptural accounts in light of what Paul has done here, where we begin to look at the person and work of Jesus and put those lenses of Christ on when we read the scriptures, we discover what you've seen already in this passage. You've discovered joy. Isn't that interesting? That if you think about Genesis 16 to 21 and you characterize it by tone, you have frustration, division, dissension, anger, mockery, um, jealousy, all of those are characterized. You look at the passage that Paul quotes to you in Isaiah 54, you have abandonment, exile, failure, but you have the prophet of God saying, sing because God is faithful. That's why a Christian has joy because we are not dependent on how consistent we are. We are dependent on how consistent Jesus has been to us. We are not um, hopeful because we have ability. We are hopeful because God has kept his promise. We are joyful and sing and rejoice in the fact that God is faithful even when we are not. And that's Paul's entire point of the story. Don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Stand firm. Lay hold of the truth of God's faithfulness to you in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this story. Thank you for the truth that we see here that in Christ alone we find true freedom in our spiritual lives. I pray that we as a church would be characterized by clinging and laying hold and standing firm with the gospel message that we have received. I pray, Father, that we would be dependent on your goodness, dependent on your faithfulness, dependent on the fact that you have accomplished for us what we could never accomplish in our own strength. And in Jesus, we have freedom, we have hope, we have forgiveness, and we are welcomed into the church in heaven. Father, it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.